so much. That was a very uh, impressive introduction. I hope I live up to it. I'm very honored to be part of your lecture series and uh, I hope that my contribution proves worthwhile. You probably all know that Meta doesn't put up with negativity. <laughs> we were chatting at the launch for this book a couple of months ago. Professor Barry Wellman, as you can see, will be speaking in this series soon. Meta asked what was keeping me busy, and I tried to complain. My vent on the way began by way of contrast with, I'm perfectly comfortable talking about, at which point Meta, instead of waiting for my complaint, interrupted me to invite me to talk about our topic today. <laughs> so here I am, and please let me begin by thanking you all very much for coming here too. Something most people don't know about my time, oh, many years ago now, as a stay-at-home mom. For years, a Hanukkah gift from my husband was a subscription to Scientific American. Remember those shiny, covered, thick issues with boxed illustrations on the front? Occasional articles explored various electoral systems from a mathematical perspective. I never bothered sorting out the details, as I was confident they would never matter to me. The system I voted under was first past the post, and it was immutable. What I remember is the alternative's variety and how changing the system could change the results. My confidence the topic would never be relevant was wrong. As a candidate in the two most recent federal elections, I knocked on a lot of doors. For a long time, I was hesitant about initiating conversations on one of our important Green Party policies, improving our democracy by updating our electoral system. As time passed, more and more people raised the topic with me on their doorsteps and in emails. Some even chewed me out because I hadn't raised it myself. Recent developments have raised public concern to new levels. Here, I'll talk about four aspects of our current Canadian situation. First of all, people have been complaining about our 39% majority. Because a little over 39% of the votes cast generated a majority of the seats in our House of Commons. The link shown is not complete. Some of tonight's information comes from the Elections Canada website. Here's the URL, but as I've said already, no need to note it. You can email me at the address on the bookmark on your seat, and I'll be happy to send you any links you want. In the beginning of the link, the key part is easy to remember. From the main page, navigate to elections, then to past elections, then make your choice. You can select the stats you want from a large number of available tables, the link is the same for all of them, and OVR stands for Official Voting Results. People have been complaining about our 39% majority because our current majority conservative government resulted from the May 2011 general election tally, which showed only 39% of those who cast ballots voted conservative. That's tonight's first fallacy. What we now know about the election indicates the Conservative formed our government based on fraud. We'll come back to the concept of a majority that's less than 50% plus one and to some fraud details. Next, let me indicate the other three fallacies we'll be exploring. Fallacy two, concern about a majority that's less than 50% and fraud has in turn led to concern about our electoral system and interest in electoral reform. This segues nicely into talk about proportional representation. All electoral reform proposals are similar, would bring in proportional representation, and would confuse voters, and would fragment government. None of those statements is true. Fallacy three. There's been much discussion lately about cross-party cooperation to bring in electoral reform. Too often, this is confused with party mergers. <coughs> it's not. 
Fourth and last, a major concern about giving up our first past the post system is that it provides each of us with a personal MP, an advocate we can call on for assistance with government related matters. That this is reliable now and is lost through electoral reform is a fallacy. Now let's explore each fallacy in more detail. You may already believe, as I do, that our current government has not reached office honestly. If you agree with me, this part of my talk will likely have some information you already know. I hope it also includes some perspectives you've not encountered. If the idea of a fraudulent government is new to you, here comes an introduction. We'll look at some of the details that came to light after the election. The robocalls have gotten the most coverage. There have also been concerns about ballot validity in a number of writings. If enough of these concerns turn out to be correct, our government is illegal. Elections Canada has been collecting data for a while and is still seeking information via its website homepage. According to recent reports, the Elections Canada focus is now limited to Guelph, Ontario. So I'll start there. The riding of Guelph was won in 2011 by Liberal incumbent Frank Valeriate. He earned 43% of the vote to the second place Conservatives 33%. The Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, the CRTC, recently fined the local Guelph Liberal Electoral District Association for robocalls which did not include the information they were from the Valeriate campaign. Elections Canada, on the other hand, is investigating robocalls by the Conservatives to non-Conservative voters. Here's a review of some of the information we have about those calls. They were reported in numerous writings. Elections Canada first started investigating them in Guelph on May 5th, 2011, three days after the election. The robocaller, falsely claiming to be from Elections Canada, directed voters to non-existent polling stations. A lot of us get a lot of robocalls. We may not appreciate them when we're trying to enjoy our dinner. But robocalling, according to the rules, is legal. Lying that you're from Elections Canada is illegal, as is interfering with someone's right to vote. The telephone from which the calls were made was a so-called disposable cell. That is, one meant to be hard to trace because it's not kept long. Registered to Pierre Poutine. Pierre hired a firm called RAC9 for these calls. The Guelph Conservative campaign also used RAC9 for legal robocalls. Earlier, legal conservative campaign calls asked those who listened to indicate their electoral preferences. The Poutine calls followed up on those. More than 6,700 Pierre Poutine calls attempted to misdirect Guelph voters who had indicated non-conservative preferences. Does anyone here use a Blackberry? Play word mole. I used a Blackberry for my three months in Ottawa last fall when I was volunteering for Canada's only Green MP, Elizabeth May, in her office on the hill. I confess to sometimes playing word mole en français. I thought I was so clever to, pe to key in P-O-U-T-I-N-E, but got the screen mot introuvable. What do those research in motion folks eat? That the numbers didn't play out in Guelph as the Conservatives, if allegations are true, planned, does not mean they might not have. We have close results in robocall writings that did send Conservatives to Ottawa. According to, for example, the CBC, as of May 16th this year, Robocall complaints from close to 200 of our 308 ridings had been reported to Elections Canada. But by the end of August, 
Reports from, for example, the Ottawa Citizen charged that information forthcoming from Elections Canada indicated they were only investigating the possibility of conservative fraud in Guelph. Whoops. Again, please be in touch if you want the links. As of now, these reports are plenty plausible, but I myself am somewhat more optimistic. For good or ill, Elections Canada reveals as little information as possible about its ongoing investigations. And as a two-time federal candidate, I can assure you Elections Canada was extremely thorough in assessing all the information my campaign was required to provide after the 2008 general election and is being even more thorough for the 2011. It has usually been not, but not always, been easy for our team to grasp exactly what the Elections Canada perspective is for the requirements. It has been consistently clear that the Elections Canada people are motivated to help, have a strong loyalty to our democratic system and the legislation that supports it. I thus believe it's quite possible more investigations will be made public in time. In time for the next federal election. Of the many robocall ridings besides Guelph that are in question, the Council of Canadians has focused on seven. Legal action to challenge elections results in those, to challenge election results in those ridings has been initiated because of what is termed voter suppression tactics, which include harassment as well as misdirection. Conservatives won in all seven ridings, some by very small margins. Here are three examples. Nipissing to Miskaming went conservative by 18 votes, with 15,495, or 36.7%, the Liberal incumbent was defeated. The Conservative won the Yukon with 33.8% of the votes. The Liberal incumbent's share was 32.9%. The Green Party's candidate received 18.9% and the NDP candidate 14.4%. The Conservative's margin was 132 votes. Keeping in mind that there are fewer than 25,000 electors on the lists up there, and that a typical riding has about 100,000, more or less, we can multiply 132 by 4 to get a comparison to pluralities in more typical ridings. But that yields a comparison figure of only 528. And third, closer to home, in Don Valley East, the Conservative won by 870 votes, but with only 36.8% to the Liberals' 34.6%. The NDP candidate received 25.2%. In July, a federal court judge upheld the application to dismiss the election results in the seven ridings, despite Conservative Party efforts to stop it. If in due course, election results in a riding are overturned, a by-election must occur. Other organizations besides the Council of Canadians are on this. A much newer one, also nonpartisan, is Lead Now. Its website states, the Conservatives only narrowly won their majority by 6,201 votes in 14 ridings, citing rabble as the source of the numbers. Some of the cited writings are among those the Council of Canadians is concerned about, but some are not. Two more writings contrast with one another. One, cited by rabble.ca, is Sydney, Victoria, Nova Scotia. It's long since been represented by liberal Mark Eiking. The writing intrigued me because I met its MP when I was in Ottawa last fall volunteering for Elizabeth. In past elections, he's typically won his riding with about 49%, whereas in 2011, 
his share of the vote dropped to 39 percent. He won by 765 votes. In contrast is Willowdale, cited by Lead Now, where liberal incumbent Martha Hall Findlay lost to the conservative candidate by 932 votes. Can we conclude that both Sydney Victoria and Guelph were targeted by the conservatives, but in those two ridings, success eluded them? Although various other robocall and other call concerns and other irregularities have been reported, the last riding I'll talk about in detail now is Etobicoke Center. The first riding where a 2011 general election generated by election may be imminent. There the concern is voter identification. Conservative Ted Opitz defeated liberal incumbent Boris Zhezinevsky by 26 votes. In May this year, the Ontario Superior Court ruled 79 ballots invalid because of voters who lacked proper identification documents or otherwise should not have been permitted to vote, or at least should not have been permitted to vote twice. The court has ordered a by-election. The Harper government is appealing. Etobicoke Center, the seven ridings the Council of Canadians is championing, plus Guelph total nine. Alternatively, there are the 14 rabble ridings, which overlap somewhat with the ones cited by Lead Now. Not to mention the other at least 150 or so where complaints have been registered. Just one more specific. Steps from here in Toronto Center, my own sign captain discovered when he went to vote that he'd already voted. What does all this mean? Our May 2011 general election gave the Conservatives 166 out of the 308 seats in our House of Commons. The numbers are now a little different. Some MPs have resigned till by-elections take place. Their seats are vacant. Other MPs' allegiances have changed. Our present parliament looks like this. Conservative MPs Bev Oda and Lee Richardson have resigned. Conservative MP Peter Goldring voluntarily left his caucus after a matter regarding a vehicle which may have involved alcohol and now sits as an independent conservative. MP Lee Sandini has crossed the floor to the Liberals. MP Bruce Heyer did not approve of the NDP's whipping votes in opposition to ending the long gun registry, so now sits as an independent. And MP Denise Savoy has resigned for health reasons. The Speaker doesn't vote unless there's a tie, but is a conservative. Enough ridings are in question to end the Harper majority. Googling, 2000 election Googling 2011 election fraud returns Canada and also Uganda and Russia. In what circles is our country now traveling? Here's eco-management consultant and former Green Party of Canada leader Jim Harris in one of his HuffPo pieces. You would expect this in some tin pot dictatorship, not in Canada. Criminal charges should be laid and by-elections called for every riding where electoral fraud occurred. Any person or firm involved should be barred from working in any election campaign ever again. And from Rick Mercer's Robo Rants, it's just our faith in democracy at stake. If we don't investigate this, Fans of voter suppression will have committed the perfect crime. Anyway, it's calculated, we have an illegal government. In our 41st parliament, Prime Minister Harper has been draconian. He's pushed through his omnibus crime and budget bills and a whole lot more. Votes are whipped, as Conservative MP David Wilkes found to his sorrow, when he publicly considered acting on his constituents' concern about Bill C-38, the omnibus budget bill, and learned how difficult that would be. Does Stephen Harper believe he's got to do as much as he can, as fast as he can, before his fraudulent government is ended? Those opposed to Harper, which based on the election returns means most of us, are waiting for by-elections but also looking beyond them. Stephen Harper has inspired increased interest in electoral reform. 
That brings us to our next fallacy. Since the spring of 2011, charges of widespread electoral fraud have fed into the electoral reform advocacy in Canada. It has a longer history. For decades, advocates have pointed to the unfairness of our current system. We saw earlier that the Conservatives received just over 39% of the votes cast in 2011. Almost 15 million ballots were cast, but there were more than 24 million electors on the lists. Our conservative majority government is due to the wishes of fewer than one out of four of those eligible to vote in Canada. We now have what Professor Peter Russell, who's right here, calls a false majority. Less than 50% of the votes, more than 50% of the seats. Professor Russell demonstrates in his book how common false majorities have been and is thus a strong advocate for electoral reform. Mm -hmm. The many individuals and groups who support electoral reform in Canada have so far been stymied by what I've summarized as fallacy two. The common belief that all electoral reform proposals are similar, would bring in proportional representation, and would thereby fragment government. To explore those errors, we'll look at some alternatives and consequences. Our system is often called first past the post, because whoever among the candidates gets the most votes, however small the percentage, wins. It's common to contrast our system with proportional representation. But not only are there various types of PR, some voting systems in use today and some reform proposals are not wholly PR, but include PR as a component. And some don't include PR at all. The Law Commission of Canada in 2004 recommended a mixed member proportional system for us whereby some MPs would be elected from single member districts like those we have now, and others would be elected proportionally from multi-member districts. You can Google voting counts, the name of the report, or go to the resources page on the Fair Vote Canada website. Fair Vote is one source for a wealth of electoral reform information. June McDonald, who's at the back there, is the one who put the fair vote information on your seats. New Zealand started using a mixed member proportional system in 1996. Because of the Law Commission's recommendation for electoral reform here, we'll look a little later at New Zealand's system. I'm not going to talk much about the Law Commission report. Civil libertarian Natalie DeRosier head of the commission at the time, and Brian Tangay, who wrote the report, will be revisiting it at a free town hall meeting open to all the week after next on October 2nd. You should have found a flyer on your chair. Please spread the word and please come. Some recommendations for Canada are neither first past the post nor proportional representation. They include the Liberal Party's recent support for preferential voting, an alternative vote system, and the local ranked ballot initiative of Toronto proposed for our municipal elections. As a Scientific American article showed, there are many options. How do you tell proportional systems from those that are not? It's easy. PR systems allocate seats in proportion to votes, so a PR system must ipso facto have districts with more than one seat. There can only be one winner in a one seat riding, so such a riding can't be divided proportionally. Let's look briefly at the two non-proportional proposals I just noted. The Liberals put their proposal for preferential voting forward at their recent national convention. Liberals would have each MP elected by at least one vote more than 50% of all the votes cast in the riding, with voters numbering candidates in preferential order. Rabbit proponents would keep our system of one city councilor per ward and one mayor. Hmm. Is a rabbit advocate here? 
Another acronym, STV, Single Transferable Vote. Types of STV are used at various levels of government in various countries. Australia is one. Single transferable vote, STV, is similar to the rabbit proposal and the new liberal alternative vote policy because for all three, voters may rank candidates on their ballots. But we've come full circle. STV involves multi-member constituencies and provides proportional representation. How can that be? How can ranked ballots work for both proportional and non-proportional systems? What AV, including Rabbit, and STV have in common, voters may but are not required to rank their ballots. Here's the difference. In our current system, one person is elected per constituency. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Ranked ballot initiative, Rabbit, one person is elected per constituency with a majority. If nobody has a majority initially, a so-called instant runoff happens. The person with the least votes is eliminated, and the second choices of the ballots of those who listed that person as their first pick are counted. This process is repeated until 50% plus one of the votes is received by someone. I just talked about rabbit. So Here's our know. rabbit person. Did you bring your hop to it flyers? I have some, yeah. Oh, well, pass them around. I just landed from Vancouver. Like oh. <laughs> anyway, isn't that beautiful, Dave? <laughs> okay, well, glad to have you. Single transferable vote, because districts are multi member, the number of votes needed isn't 50% plus one. Instead, a threshold is determined for the number required to win a seat. Voters' first and, if necessary, second and further choices are counted until the needed number of candidates each has the needed number of votes. First past the post and alternative voting, including rabbit, one candidate wins. A voter makes an either or choice. Second and subsequent choices only count if the voter's first choice is eliminated. STV multiple candidates win. A voter makes a top choice and other choices in order. More than one of a voter's choices can win. An STV goal is to minimize wasted votes. What's a wasted vote? Certainly the votes of all those MPs who opposed the omnibus budget bill this past spring were wasted. Majority behavior like that leads many ordinary voters to deem their votes wasted if they've not voted for winners. What about votes for winners? Kevin Sorensen has been the Conservative MP for the Alberta riding of Crowfoot since 2000. In 2011, he won his seat with almost 84% of the votes cast. If I were staunch conservative, I'd vote, but I'd wonder why I got up that morning. STV systems work both ends toward the middle. With STV, Crowfoot would be, part, would be part of a larger multi-member riding. Voters would be able to number their ballots, one for each voter's top pick, two for next, and so on. When it was clear Sorensen had crossed the threshold, having earned enough votes to win his seat, the second choices on the ballots on which he was first would be distributed. In a riding with no initial winner or winners, the candidate receiving the fewest votes would be eliminated and the second choices on those ballots on which he or she had been first would be distributed. Here's an STV ballot from Scotland with instructions summarized and enlarged. And we missed that one. So you can look at that for a sec. STV and ranked ballots and other non-first-past-the-post ballot systems have been used all over the world by people no brighter or more experienced than we are. Understanding how a voting system works informs voting decisions. In our first past the post system, many of us spend a lot of time thinking about the implications of our votes for the other candidates' chances. 
Electoral reform supporters would rather we and our fellow voters could spend our pre-election time evaluating candidates rather than worrying about how our votes might bring exactly the opposite of what we want. MP and former liberal leader of Canada, Stéphane Dion, recently presented a detailed proposal for electoral reform. It's not for a single transferable vote. He wants voters to have two choices. He refers to his P3 system because it's proportional, preferential, and personalized. Preferential. On the ballot, each voter would rank order his or her political party choices and also mark his or her top pick for a candidate from his or her first choice party. Dion's method of sorting voter choices closely resembles the STV system. It's proportional and it's personalized. Dion is choose party lists in favor of having votes directly determine which candidates earn seats. For details, you can Google Stéphane Dion P3. That's uh, not Céline Dion MP3. <laughs> Dion believes his system will encourage cross-party cooperation. This view is consistent with long experience of similar systems throughout the world. The reason every politician wants to be at least every voter's second choice, in PR systems, politicians who make the effort to show how well they are willing to work with their opponents tend to earn more votes than those who treat their fellow contenders belligerently. Quite a contrast to our first pass the post system, eh? This perspective helps us examine the last part of this second fallacy, the fear I mentioned that electoral reform would fragment political debate. First past the post systems, it is argued, stifle debate by disproportionately advantaging large political parties. It is felt the cure for this could be worse than the disease. A PR system could enable people from so many different political parties to hold seats that any resultant legislative assembly would be hamstrung and elections would be dismayingly frequent. Italy and Israel are sometimes cited in this context. However, today there are numerous PR systems, various variants, working around the world very well. Experts advise not setting the minimum percentage of votes to yield representation too low. For example, enabling every group that earned 1% of the vote in Canada to send at least one MP to Ottawa would yield a very dysfunctional parliament. A minimum can also be too high. Renowned blogger Wilf Day, who said he would come except it's his wife's birthday, <laughs> An expert on electoral reform nuances points out in his evaluation of the Dion proposal the Turkish 10% threshold, which they adopted to keep out the Kurdish party, is regarded in Europe as undemocratic. Typical minimums range between 3 and 5%. What to do? Before we explore options for proceeding, Let's look at the other two fallacies I promised to offer you, and a further promise. My remarks about them will be shorter than the ones about the first two. Fallacy three, whoops, you saw this earlier. There's been much discussion lately about cross-party cooperation to bring in electoral reform. Too often this is confused with pushing for party mergers. It's not. We all know about talk of mergers, I've heard it at the door and at all candidates' meetings. Greens aren't comfortable merging with any other party in the House. Our policies taken as a whole, including those on the economy, the environment, and our communities, are not congruent with any other parties. A liberal NDP merger makes sense to some. Others find it extremely unlikely. Merger and cooperation are not the same. Although at the moment, merger of any of those of our federal parties with seats in Parliament seems unlikely, cross-party cooperation is being discussed a lot and is even in process. One reason 
for any public confusion of merger and cooperation is media confusion. Simcoe North is a strongly conservative riding, at least for the nonce. Greens, liberals, and NDP members have started meeting to make plans to work together. Participants report an attitude of mutual respect. They're voluntarily discussing issues of common interest, are proud to include members loyal to all three parties. The new group's first topic was scrutineering because participants were all concerned at the lack of non-conservative scrutineers in the riding in recent elections. The group has been considering other efforts as well, lately during a picnic at a park. You can see that here. Here's the local paper's headline for its article about that picnic. The writer was impressed at the gathering of 50 in conversation about forming a unified opposition to unseat the conservative and bring in electoral reform. The word merger did not appear in the article, and the writer noted the way the effort will be organized has yet to be determined. Members of the group explain why. Theirs is a grassroots movement, and they are not clear on how much they can accomplish without central party support. Likewise, a group has formed in Peterborough to figure out a way to oppose conservative and MP Dean Del Mastro with just one cross-party candidate. According to the CBC's news clip, one of the group's spokesperson persons, one of the group's spokespersons is a former Del Mastro supporter. And in Owen Sound, some people have started exploring what a grassroots group can do in the face of the power held by the federal political parties. Here in Toronto is a group founded by NDP members, liberals, greens, former progressive, former progressive conservatives, and some folks who are unaligned. It's given itself a grandiose name, the Canadian Electoral Alliance. Former NDP MP Lynn McDonald's position paper is available on the group's website, electoralalliance.ca. There have been monthly meetings called Democracy Salons, which we're eager for all interested to join, and we're hosting the October 2nd Town Hall on Electoral Reform I brought to your attention earlier. Perhaps the highest profile group so far nearby is Citizens for Cross-Party Cooperation in Kitchener-Waterloo. The group envisions a one-time effort in 2015 to run a single unity candidate against the conservative. This is federal only. A Green, a Liberal, and an NDP candidate all ran in the provincial by-election there a couple of weeks ago. There's activity further afield as well. The yet-to-be-called federal by-election in Calgary Center has inspired OneCalgaryCenter.com. The organization's goal is a consensus candidate. One Calgary Center is an effort to skip over political parties and connect directly with individual voters. The website slogan is Mobilize, Select, Elect. And the plan is to send a progressive to parliament via an innovative and evolutionary approach to democracy. Talk about cooperation is also ongoing within political parties. Planning to defeat the opposition, even through cooperation, is what political parties do. After the 2011 election, more Canadians than ever realized our electoral system is dysfunctional. There's now some talk about some form of electoral cooperation for the 2015 election only to bring in electoral reform. If it happened, it would only need to happen once if electoral reform results. How it would play out is thus far unclear. A candidate unaffiliated with any one party, whom more than one party nonetheless chooses to endorse, a common nomination meeting, non-compete agreements by party leaders for ridings in addition to their own, the devil is in the details. If nomination meetings include more than one party, the NDP would overwhelm the Liberals in some places 
and vice versa in others. If you usually supported the party that was overwhelmed, would you be happy to vote for the nominated candidate or would you refuse? Some people feel very, very strongly that parties should offer candidates in as many ridings as they can because every voter deserves to have the opportunity to vote for the candidate from the party he or she most wishes to support. Nathan Cullen ran for the NDP leadership with this goal. He suggested pre-campaign runoffs among the non-conservatives in relevant ridings. He's been an MP since 2004 and had considerable support for this commitment, but not enough to win the leadership contest. The NDP's new leader, Thomas Mulcair, opposes electoral cooperation. According to some voices in the cross-party cooperation group here in Toronto, Mulcair's refusal might change. At last month's Green Party of Canada convention, three motions were passed supporting cross-party cooperation to bring in electoral reform. They must be ratified by our membership, likely will be. My contribution to the discussion at the convention was to urge specifics, which others had explained wording implied, be made explicit. My personal view is that campaign promises to bring in electoral reform have been broken and can be broken again. My standard is that a candidate commit, if elected, to making electoral reform the very first item on her or his agenda. We've just been exploring some aspects of cross-party cooperation. Were cross-party cooperation to bring in electoral reform, we would need to learn about its consequences. That brings us to fallacy four. Electoral reform takes away the one-to-one -one connection each of us has with the Member of Parliament. There are two things wrong with this assumption. First, it doesn't take anything away. It adds connections. And second, the first-past-the-post connections we have now are at best highly variable in their reliability. Any system with a proportionality component adds constituencies of interest. That term is used by New Zealand MP and co-leader of the New Zealand Greens, Mithiria Ture. She joined us last month in Sydney, BC at the Green Party of Canada's National Convention. She shared her knowledge and experience of New Zealand's mixed member proportional system. New Zealand's legislature is unicameral. About 60% of these seats are electorate seats. What does that mean? Sorry, yeah, one chamber. They don't have a Senate. And about 40% are list seats. New Zealand consists of the North Island and the less populous South Island. The South Island gets a slightly larger number of electorate seats than its population would warrant. And New Zealand's indigenous population, the Maori, have an electoral roll and seven specifically allocated electoral seats. Each Mary voter may choose to vote as a member of the Mary roll or as part of the general roll. Census data determine electorate seat boundaries, which are drawn to keep each riding as equal in population as possible. The term list seats makes sense to me, but electorate seats did not. It seems to me that all seats filled through election anywhere could be called electorate seats. The explanation, New Zealand, like Canada, is divided into electoral districts. Here, electoral districts are often called ridings. There, the equivalent term is electorates. Every voter may make two choices on his or her ballot, one for a candidate, the electorate MP, and the other for a party. Electorate seats are first past the post. The party vote determines proportionality. Before the election, every political party in New Zealand may create a rank-ordered list of its candidates. For list MPs, voters don't vote for individuals. A party that gets enough votes nationally to mean it won, say, five seats, but whose candidates won seats in only three ridings, may add two MPs from its list. If a party is entitled to one list seat, 
its top ranked candidates gets that seat, and so on. Curiously, although candidate and party popularity are not congruent in every riding, they seem to balance out rather accurately, although various adjustments come into play. A party must win at least 5% of the total party vote, or at least one electorate seat, in order to have any list seats, thereby addressing the danger noted earlier that proportional representation designed badly can fragment. An individual electorate seat can be lost by an unpopular electorate MP from a popular party without affecting the total number of seats that party has. The opposite can result in an overhang or extra seat added to the legislature. There can be underhang seats too if a party's list isn't long enough. And another possibility, Greens have a caucus of 14, yearn. All list MPs, as the Green Party decided not to run any electorate candidates. Thus, New Zealanders who wish to contact their MPs can choose whom to reach in more than one way. Perhaps one's local MP might be best, or perhaps an MP in the political party one favors most, or perhaps an MP with a congruent position on the relevant issue, any of us can contact any MP we wish, and many of us have been at one end or the other of campaigns, urging emails to all of them. What's the worth of our option? Some MPs use it now to shut down dialogue. Those just mentioned mass campaigns often generate auto replies saying more or less politely, if you're not for my riding, you're not going to hear from me again. Our House of Commons is soon to grow. One justification for increasing the number of seats is to maintain the personal MP possibility as Canada's population grows. But does it really work? My own MP is the Honorable Bob Ray. I don't support his politics, you knew that. But I hope we can all agree on the depth and breadth of his knowledge and experience. He's been a politician since his teens, if not before. He's a hardworking and conscientious one, and his intelligence and motivation are considerable. Over the years, many, many groups and many, many individuals have successfully support, sought his support and guidance. However, when I've knocked on doors and when I'm out and about in the riding, I not infrequently meet folks who complain to me they've contacted his team for one reason or another, <coughs> and have been ignored. I came to realize that politics aside, if even Bob Ray fails to meet constituents' expectations, there's something wrong with our system. The, so the solution I offered in the 2011 general election campaign was community democracy ambassadors. I envisioned having two small adjacent apartments in Ottawa, one for me and one for a constant stream of visitors from the riding. We'd share breakfasts, and then they'd see what the Hill could offer on issues of concern to them. And then we'd communicate what we'd all learned about achieving goals in Ottawa and back in the riding. Had I been elected, this would have been fun to do and would have built expanding connections. It can work better once we, once we achieve electoral reform via the constituencies of interest, Materia explained. So how do we achieve electoral reform? How do we fix Canada's electoral system? Referenda to date haven't worked. They failed to bring electoral reform in either BC or Ontario. Those involved in the Ontario campaign believe public information was inadequate. Again, from personal experience. I retired from teaching high school in June 2006, then took a fellowship to work for 10 months with teachers in Greenland. I returned to Toronto to discover Ontario's electoral reform referendum. Trying to get up to speed, I organized one of those government-provided traveling presentations in our building. The presenter who came could not have been more motivated or gracious, but she deflected most questions by saying she couldn't answer them as she was required to be impartial. Hindsight has brought many reflections on these campaigns. At least one expert, Professor Dennis Pylon, has argued that these ballot box losses 
have made achieving electoral reform even more difficult. In my experience, votes that present various options for replacing the status quo do not encourage change. When I was teaching, the Toronto Board paid us in a curious way. More in September and June, less through the year to make up. I thought at least most of us were likely smart enough to realize we were working 10 months a year, prep work for future classes, and enrolling in summer courses aside, while we were hoping to eat for all 12 months. We regularly voted. One proposal was the status quo. There were usually about three alternatives. The total vote for the alternatives usually exceeded the vote for the status quo, but the status quo won because it got more votes than any of the alternatives. Sounds like first past the post, eh? One possible path is that recommended by the Green Party of Canada. It includes familiar components. The new wrinkle is combining them. First, a broad public inquiry with royal commission powers would hear from as many of us as possible on all current concerns, including problems with our electoral system, aggrandizement of power by the prime minister, whipping, and more. Voting would follow. It's possible such an inquiry would generate enough publicity to motivate change. It's arguable New Zealand voted in electoral reform, and we didn't, because the Kiwis had become furious over a protracted period about the failings of their system and their government. For their first vote in 1992, it was reported, the people didn't speak, they screamed. And their recent referendum to continue their MMP system passed with a larger margin than did the original vote, which brought it about in 1993. Voter turnout down there is now around 80%. We can dream, can't we? The Toronto group I mentioned earlier, the Canadian Electoral Alliance, sent a letter to every MP this past June requesting support for a private member's bill for electoral reform. So far, the only commitment we've received in response has been from Elizabeth May. She will be researching the possibility of introducing such a bill and offers to collaborate with any other interested MPs. When I was in Elizabeth's office in the Confederation Building, the corner bank in Wellington, I experienced enthusiasm for research challenges every day. The failed amendments for the Omnibus Crime Bill, the failed amendments for the Omnibus Budget Bill were seen as learning experiences. Her young legislative assistant is confident the hours and hours he worked on them will stand him and Elizabeth in good stead. Any MP may introduce as many private member bills as she or he wishes, but only one may be debated per session. We can hope, if rumors are wrong and Parliament is not prorogued, this bill will be drafted, colleagues second it, and Elizabeth gives a rousing speech supporting it in the House, which those of us keen for electoral reform can then spread widely. Other paths to electoral reform. I've described some grassroots activity. Perhaps one group will achieve a breakthrough and set a precedent. One CalgaryCenter.com's.ca's strategy is the most specific so far. They're planning to develop a process using online voting to select and then support one candidate. This plan solves the problem cross-party cooperation could generate, that agreement at the top doesn't mean individual voters will follow through by voting as recommended. Will one CalgaryCenter.ca be a harbinger of democratic renewal by making the best choice possible? Whether the focus is on building consensus or simply mobilizing to oppose Harper remains to be seen. And so far, the one Calgary Center information includes concern about the electoral process deficiencies but seems to indicate the solution is a consensus candidate, not electoral reform. The upcoming by-election bears watching on many levels. One path still waiting to be explored and trod is international. Canada's image has been barely tarnished by prorogation, contempt of parliament, and electoral fraud. People in other countries, no matter how politically engaged, just haven't noticed 
I'd urge any of you with international connections to seek more attention for our situation. As well, I urge all of us to press for international election observers. Canada sends them elsewhere, but to my knowledge, we've not had any. Official international observers only go to countries that have invited them. As Meta mentioned, my husband and I were lucky enough to have been in the group Canada sent to Ukraine during the Orange Revolution at the end of 2004. There were almost 500 of us. We saw officials working in their communities as hard as they could to achieve free and fair elections. We were happy travelers on the plane back to Canada. Someone yelled, on to Ohio and Florida. In fact, the US had hosted 100 official observers during its presidential election the month before. And Ohio was discussed extensively in their report. And you'll remember the Florida hanging chads date from the 2000 presidential election. Recently, Canada hasn't sent very many official observers anywhere. The Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, in desperate need of international observers, received six. Other nations this year and last typically received fewer. Yet for next month's elections in Ukraine, Canada has already sent a team of long-term observers and will be sending hundreds more for short-term observation. Press to have Ukraine reciprocate by sending observers here, starting with our upcoming by-elections, and urge that Canada be added to the list of those nations receiving observers as a matter of course. International attention, a private member's bill, as yet unclear methods for settling on unity candidates. Another yawn-inducing royal commission. Perhaps in true Canadian style, we're riding off in all directions at once. Or perhaps we're making a very good beginning by understanding that we're dealing with electoral fraud. We're talking not about party mergers, but about one-off cooperation for electoral reform. Understanding the various electoral options will facilitate settling on one that works for us. And when we do, we'll not have lost anything, we'll have gained. Thanks for your attention. Let's talk more about this now. Questions? Comments? Thank you. Thanks so much. That's a, a, more than a good beginning. It's like the whole shebang. Thank you. Overwhelming. These alternative systems are not really a, um, on a left to right continuum, or they're not really partisan completely. That's right. They're, they're, That's right. You can be one party or another and pick and choose from a, a, a variety of. You, any one party would include people rep, uh, advocating a, a variety of different. Yes, yes. You can see that any yeah. any that there is a variety of different perspectives advocated. For example, within the Liberal Party, you've got Stefan Dion's proposal, which is different from the official Liberal position. And every time he speaks, he's at great pains to make sure everybody knows that his speaking is with the approval of his party. So there is but a range. Is there yes. an but the Liberal Party does not officially say Dion's system is what we endorse, nothing else. So no, that's right. That's right. They, and they the actually, same with, as you described, Elizabeth May having an approach to a solution. She doesn't give you the solution. That's right. right. What, what the Green Party is envisioning is that there will be a grassroots development yeah. if this process is followed. So it's uh, a matter of the process by which you might come up with the yeah. system. It's not that she's advocating a particular system yet. That's right. That's right. So there are so many different... Uh, approaches or systems that you have introduced us here, to here, it would be interesting if we had, you know, if we structured this whole thing as particular people advocating particular systems, then it would look more like a debate, which I don't think necessarily is a good idea. Well, this but meeting coming up might be more like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one that you have the flyer for on October 2nd. Would it be that way? 
Yeah. It might I, be. Yeah, it would be great to have people from different perspectives. If, if there are people here who have, um, who are advocating particular things, maybe they can identify that as, as you ask questions. I'm going to sit down and let you field your own questions. <coughs> okay, came in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Canadians for Justice is a not for profit uh, organization. Uh, the mandate is to try to cause trouble for companies and governments that do harm to, the, to Canada, or Canadians. And uh, so we'll be doing some larger lawsuits. But the first project that we chose was electoral reform. And the reason we did that is because, other than climate change, which is obviously a global problem, uh, we believe that electoral reform is the biggest justice issue facing people in Canada because their voices are not being heard a lot of the time. So um, we have actually thought a lot about the problem. And uh, we've come up with simple solutions. So just very briefly, the principles, our governing principles for electoral reform are government should reflect the consensus of the majority of the voters. It's not possible to have a healthy democracy when the electoral system produces undemocratic results. And a majority government built by consensus would better serve the interests of Canadians and strengthen us as a society because really voter participation is so low and people just don't even bother getting interested. Uh, so because they're, they're, there's a culture of, that it's self-defeating and that's not an accident. You know? So um, we, uh, our view is though that there's nobody really advocating for a single choice and that's a problem. It's also a problem that nobody can pick, right? That nobody, there's no leading organization. Uh, I mean, we're small, but we're growing, and hopefully we can be the catalyst. But the idea is to try to build a consensus that people can understand. The formula how is... How can we... F go ahead with your formula, and then how can we find and you? understandable equals sellable. The problem is, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I've got two law degrees. I listen to these presentations. And I see the eyes of the people in the audience, and it's very, very hard to communicate the advantages and disadvantages of one system over the other. And, and you spend so much time discussing it, and you're, you lose the audience, and you, you can't get the support of the people to, to make it happen. So we've decided, we've defined a system that's easy to do, very understandable, minimal change, but gets better results, in fact, than a lot of the, in terms of reflecting the voter attention than a lot of the mixed systems. Do you have a website? Yeah. Because I had trouble finding your website. It's so canadiansforjustice.org. Okay, let's put that up and then maybe we can give some other people a turn. Yeah, it just, can I just, just very simply yeah. say the system. People vote how they do now. Candidates run in writings as they do now. Seats are allocated to parties provincially because we have a constitutional limit. Our provinces have a certain number of seats. So the seats are allocated to parties based on their share of the popular vote in each province. So every, everything's to the voter the same. What's different is what we do with the votes that are counted. And there's, you'll find on the website the whole, the math of it all. It's not hard to understand. And essentially uh, what happens is seats are allocated to parties based on their share of the popular vote in the province, but the list of candidates is determined based on their popular vote in their riding. So the parties don't pick who's on the party lists and their ranking. The, the, the ranking is done based on how well they did in their own writings. So if the NDP got 30 seats based on the popular vote, their top 30 candidates to be elected are the people who, uh, who got the most votes in their own writing. So you just rank them by the percentage of popular vote in their writing for their party, and then that's how they get placed on the list. Okay, so it's really thank simple. You. There's more information, and we also believe in what the lead now in the NDP, sorry, the Greens want, which is um, some form of cooperation for the next election only. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Dave. Well, so I run the Rabbit campaign in Toronto. Website's rabbit.ca. I've got some materials here for people who uh, have any questions about it. Um, I was just in British Columbia for three days and I met with the mayor of Vancouver yesterday and they're trying to move STV forward in Vancouver. So that's exciting. I think the next big shift uh, in electoral form is more likely to happen at the local level despite all the amazing efforts and this is all fantastic. Uh, I think it would be great to give, you know when you go to a restaurant and they have all these different things and then you can get like 
um, platter, like a taster platter. That was kind of each thing. So I think it'd be cool if in Canada we had instant runoff voting in Toronto, MMP in Montreal, and STD in Vancouver, <coughs> uh, which I think are all viable. And then uh, these wouldn't be obscure systems that were referring to the countries on the other side of the world. We could have experience right here in Canada. Um, and then I had a question for you, which was, you said four motions were passed. Um, three, at three the, at yeah. the, but you didn't say what they were specifically, so oh, I'm curious what um, they were. Oh, they overlap. They are for um, electoral reform. And I personally am not sure how it's going to work because they overlap. So, so one of them, and it's for cross-party cooperation for electoral reform. One of them is specifically with the NDP and the Liberals and one of them is more general, and one of them uh, is worded even more generally than that. Okay. And uh, again, I can provide anyone who wants with the specific wording, it's on the Green Party website, and um, you can, or you can email me. But uh, if they overlap, I'm not sure how the logistics are going to play out, but that will all remain to be seen. Okay. Cool. And I just want to encourage people to join Faribault Canada. Both June and I are on the okay. Toronto Executive, and uh, we'd love to have you get involved with the movement. Uh, despite what you're saying, which is true, it'd be nice if there was one thing to rally behind. The Faribault philosophy is that if we try and focus on one reform, we'll just end up fighting internally, and trust me, they will. So the idea is that Faribault advocates for a process uh, rather than advocating for a particular reform, which doesn't stop anyone from advocating for a particular reform, as I'm doing in Toronto or anyone else can do. But join the movement. And also a new thing, uh, you should join this. I met with Anthony Hodgson in Vancouver. He's the head of uh, Fair Voting BC, or he's involved. What's his position, June? Um, yeah, he's head of, head of Fair Voting BC. He's starting a na national program called DANCE, uh, Dem Democracy Ac Action Net Network of Canada. It's an internal project for any group working on voting reform to be communicating with, with each other. Rabbits joined as of yesterday. I'm sure they'd love to have you on board too. And thank you for all your work. And that's all I have to say for now, unless there's questions. Yes, back in the very back. Uh, that per, per, he has a perfectly valid point. The confusion that the public has in understanding something so vague and varied as what we continually talk about is a real problem. Yes, yes. And, I think. And, and, no, no wonder it didn't sell in Ontario because we we're, we we're going to take a study and do another study and come up with something down there. That's that was a hell of a thing to try and make people vote for. It's interesting to compare what, what he has said is, what the gentleman has said is that there's too much confusion and that kind of hamstrings the whole process. And it's interesting to compare what happened in New Zealand because there were two things that were different. Uh, between Canada and New Zealand. One is this protracted fury that was going on down there. And I don't feel that here universally across Canada. Um, but the other thing is that after um, the vote, the initial vote, which was a non-binding vote, took place, then uh, the parties in power tried to renege and the populace held their feet to the fire played them off one against one, the other um, in a way that I haven't seen happen here in that context. It's interesting I heard on the radio uh, just today about the auto workers negotiations and maybe uh, I think over the years, over the decades, uh, they've successfully played the big three automakers against one another and maybe we should start looking at how they do that and uh, take some lessons from that because this is what this is the two major differences between New Zealand's achievement of electoral reform and our not succeeding thus far. So any, yes, in the, yeah, um, and I, then I you. I agree that um, in Ontario, anyway, when they elect Yeah, this gentleman has, has said it's, it's too complicated. And one answer to that that I saw somewhere on the web um, in explanation of STV, it's simple to vote was the slogan that put that one forward. And uh, there are ways, I mean, I am a teacher and uh, I enjoyed teaching the kind of kids who didn't want to be in my class um, and getting them to start liking it. And uh, there are ways of making information more accessible and that would be part of the process, I think, that would have to happen. You're absolutely right. Um, and you had a question. Yes, I just, my question would be, how do we 
convince the party in power that this is important? Because it seems to me it doesn't serve the interests of Mr. Harper to have this reform. Yeah, you're absolutely right. How do we serve the party in power? How do we convince the party in power to get behind this? We've seen it with the conservatives. When they were not in power, they were off for electoral reform. When they got into power under first past the post, where did it go? Uh, and we've seen it provincially with other parties, uh, the NDP, for example. So um, you're absolutely right. That's, that's a major hurdle. And as I say, what happened in New Zealand was a very interesting political experience down there. And uh, it would be good if we could learn from it. More? Yes, way in the back. Um, just the first thought, I think we need to be a, a bit careful when, when discussing uh, how complicated some of these reforms might be because generally we're not, that sounds like we're not giving Canadian voters very much credit. Um, it's, it's certainly not much more complicated than choosing car insurance. We're um, not giving Canadian voters enough credit when we say that these reforms are threatening. That most of us are perfectly capable of deciding what kind of car insurance to buy, so why can't we uh, use a different electoral system? Now go on. Um, the, the question that I, that I have, um, actually as, as a philosophy student, um, this, is, this is interesting, because it seems to me that democracy isn't something that a citizen should be able to opt out of. And um, that's why I'm wondering, of all of the systems that are, that are suggested, how do they tackle um, voting apathy, which is to say people who don't show up to vote, because you can't, it seems to me, you can't give up the democratic right. So the, that non-vote needs to be taken into consideration in some way as a statement in itself. Participation in democracy should not be optional. And how do we overcome voter apathy? And you're actually legally required to vote in Australia, and people are very proud of that. Um, so that, that that could be an option too. I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, in non-democratic countries, I spent some time, uh, more than two years, volunteering as a teacher in Ukraine, and I learned that under the Soviet system, you voted because it was part of your community responsibility. Of course, you didn't have any choice. You just voted. So that, that perhaps we need an element of that and perhaps uh, how do you think Canadians would feel about being required to vote? It's, it's uh, not what I talked about tonight, but it's certainly interesting to think about. Yes? I think we need to approach that issue a little bit of caution. In Australia, a lot of people just vote down alternatively, mm -hmm. and they actually have to randomize the names because back in the 70s, you could only get elected in office if you had a name that started above M. <laughs> so the, the way uh, this fellow is explaining the way that, that um, Australians who resent being required to vote uh, is just to tick off on their ballots in order or randomly so that it, uh, they discovered they had to uh, randomize the ballots uh, so that the person at the head of the alphabet would, um, you would win, Mark Day. <laughs> yes? But I think the issue really to be discussed is why people don't vote because this is the reason of, of to, that has to be tackled and I think the fair vote uh, or finding an alternative that will give me the belief that I have influence will make me vote mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't have to be mandatory because people will be interested to, to make the statement. So but that's if, the but, but I have to say that even though car insurance is complicated. When I was listening to you, it is extremely complicated and extremely confusing. You understand, like all of those choices for me who doesn't have any legal uh, preparation and so on. And it's very intimidating. So to a, it, it is going to, it has to be very clearly explained to the populace. And, and I think right now I don't hear it. I, mm -hmm. I hear a lot of complexity. I mean, just my personal view, it, it, it is not packaged very clearly. That's so I idea. don't know what am I, what am I going to have as an event. I'm definitely against hardware, whatever it takes. But, but how do I get, uh, you know, to, to actually vote for the right system so that the situation with the 39% Majority is not going to repeat itself. Doesn't matter if it's Harper or anybody else. 
Thank I you. I don't know. June. Yeah. One of the advantage of proportional systems, as Ellen pointed out, is they're multi-member. And, and, and I know there's lots of um, ideas that people have to simplify the system so that we continue with our single uh, member or plurality riding. Um, but the, the advantage that proportional systems give, and it happens all across the world, is the multi-member component allows more diversity. So the top countries for representation of women and getting women elected all have a proportional component. So they all have some kind of a multi-member feature. And it not only helps women, because women are a proxy for other groups as well. It gets better representation for other groups. So whenever you have a proportional system, you have a multi-member aspect, and that provides the diversity. So not only diversity for policy, but diversity for people. So we have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Oh, now I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Help! <laughs> Too many people. Keenan. Yes, um, I actually worked on the election uh, last fall in the provincial election, and I was counting the votes. And that was a difficult process. I know it doesn't sound like it was a difficult process, but with people Xing and checking and like having dots and like sometimes covering the thing and that kind of stuff, there was a lot of issues counting the votes as it was you know, just in the provincial election. Imagine how much more complicated it's going to be once there's proportional representation in that kind of thing. Isn't that a concern that we have to also address? Yes, the concern that uh, voting as it is now, counting ballots is, can be a challenge, and so won't it be even more complicated? And again, if you look at these other countries that do it successfully, uh, we're not any slower witted than the people in these other countries and we can follow their example for what we approve of uh, and learn from them so that, that uh, I'm, I'm not actually worried about the logistics. Uh, what I am worried about when you bring up uh, your counting of the ballots and with physical ballots and with scrutineers who are watching and everybody participating. I worry about losing that. I personally don't have a whole lot of confidence in electronic voting. And I'm interested in seeing how my concerns are addressed as that goes forward. But that's, again, off topic to what we were discussing this evening. Um, go ahead, Bill. OK. Uh, I think you, you made a, a very valid point about the need to sell the system of some kind of change. And uh, I think this is something also that our spokesman for, for Fair Vote uh, uh, came up with. And I think there's, a, there's another reason why this is important. And that is if you put up only one system just out of the clear blue, blue sky, it's very easy to pick it off and, and defeat it. And uh, I think the, the effort has to be of pushing all of these alternative systems uh, strongly enough and showing the uh, uh, difficulties of the current system and what, what they leave us with so that the public will say, well, we don't care which one, but we've got to do something. And so this, this doesn't argue for going in one direction or another now, but saying that the, the common direction of all of them is something that uh, you have to start backing. So perhaps a multi-step process. First, getting agreement on the need for change, and then um, mounting a campaign to clarify the options for change exactly. once we've made that commitment as a country. Peter. It's really great to hear all this discussion, but folks, uh, if you're not angry, I want to tell you, I am, and I think you ought to be. What you've got now is a government representing 39% of the electorate, not of the eligible voters, but of the, those who voted. 60% of the Canadians did not want to increase our prison population. Aren't you upset about that? 60% yeah. of our population didn't want to be contentious of Parliament. Doesn't that bother you? 60% of Canadians, that's three out of every 
five did not want to change our parliamentary system instead of passing one law at a time, put them all in one bill, limit debate. You're not angry about that? <laughs> Jeez, I am. <laughs> now look, in New Zealand, uh, as Alan quite properly says, when it's there, you, you've got to care about those things. They, they had 10 years of rotten government, both labor and national. And the people were really pissed off. And when you get pissed off and want to do something, you've got to sort of remember, you need to change the electoral system. That's the key. That's the key. If you start arguing about how, and your system is better than his system or her system, the liberals and conservatives will love it. Now, I said liberals and conservatives. As one of our audience said, they have a lot to lose. Uh, by changing the electoral system. They are the big winners. So you've got to work hard on younger people, mainly, uh, who are liberals and conservatives. And what's extremely important as we move towards 2015 is that <coughs> three parties, and we already have two of them committed, the NDP and the Greens, and the third party, the Liberals, and I think they're going to come on, are going to say uh, they are committed as parties to reforming the electoral system. I doubt if they will say just what, this, what, what it will be, MNP or STB or so on, uh, but they are going to make that commitment. And that's our main hope, is that the Liberals uh, will join uh, that kind of movement for electoral reform. And, uh, and I think we've all got to just, uh, I know that sort of leaves the Conservatives out in the block out, but those three parties, that's just crucial. And the election's a little way off. Uh, I think uh, Fair Vote Canada is a, is a great multi-party, multi-partisan organization that you may be in other organizations, like uh, Canadians for Justice, that's terrific but also support Fair Vote Canada. That's the sort of, that can bring us together and, and there's great, great benefits in joining together. And our, our real strength, if, if we split up into little groups fighting over this system or that, uh, you know, the leaders of the Conservatives and the old fashioned leaders of the Liberal Party, they're just going to say, isn't that terrific? <coughs> they're fighting it out. Okay. They're going to be scared if they see a real majority, a possibility of majority of Canadians electing parties, combination of parties, com the next election, House of Commons, committed to electoral reform. And so you're, you so you're suggesting <laughs> of the various options that I presented at the end of my talk, you're saying we also need, or maybe paramount, is to pressure the current political parties to well, push for yes, this. And yeah. Voters, uh, General Cannon did a good thing last week, as June knows, and I try, we had little dinner parties. I had one in, in a, a Democracy Week dinner party for liberals and conservatives in my building, who I know, who are smart, engaged, a lot of professional people. Uh, I kind of bribe my wife's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> she did all the cooking, I did all the talking. But at the end of the evening, uh, all those people signed the petition, June, they, uh, I'm going to give you that petition. Uh, they all signed, and I, uh, and this is the petition to the House of Commons, the supporting electoral reform. None of them were Greens, except myself and my wife. None of them were NDP. Uh, so i just give you that as an example. And, and we had an evening of conversation uh, about this. They had many, many questions. Uh, just to give you one example, one of the women who's, who's been a school teacher a lot of her life said she didn't know there were alternatives. She didn't know what at first past the post was. She said, that's just like breathing. That's the way you vote. Now remember this whole, and this is a very intelligent, I know, very well-educated woman, a teacher herself. So that's what you have to do. You just got to move those people. But. The issue here, I think, is the apathy, which we've discussed. People are not listening. Um, and I'm not just as a practical suggestion, 
is to actually uh, have, uh, you can run contests, quizzes, and say here is what, this, this system of voting, here are the results, what exactly would happen? And make it practical and, and have people figure it out slowly and say, hey, it didn't happen here with us in my writing. I vote. A lot of people don't bother voting. Why? What's the point? And, you know, if there was any ways to outlaw polls, that would be fantastic for democracy. What is the end? Don't get me started on how come we announce results before the polls close on the West Coast. It's, it's, it's so anti-democratic, it blows your mind. But it's the apathy and the engagement of people. We don't have people coming out to vote because it's not so much they don't care. You hear all the time, well, they're all the same, and they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I say to you that to work on political parties and, and push, your, push that through to influence political parties, the main population doesn't trust what comes out of the political parties anyways, and it has to be grassroots, and people have to understand what happened, that they were disenfranchised even when they did vote. So a specific example, for MMP, for example, coming up with an exact plan for the larger ridings and then saying, well, this is what Parliament would look like in consequence is what you have with in numbers. mind. And then, yes, Funny yes. Funny I would say with numbers. <laughs> Marcia was a math teacher. <laughs> and then your turn, and then you. Yes, I would just like to look down the road. Uh, supposing that we all band together, we are finding success, and, and we're, we're starting to win over Canadians, and then Mr. Harper and his attack heads come to the fore <laughs> because he's got a lot of money, and he's got a lot to lose if this is successful. We've got to be very clear on what our game plan would be when his negative response begins because that has been his pattern. Whenever one of the other parties is showing signs of doing well, the attack heads begin. So I think, you know, I think we have to be very clear on what our goals are and how we're going to fight misinformation. I think you're right. The, the campaigns, a, a number of campaigns in other countries have been David and Goliath campaigns. Mm -hmm. And coming up with strategies, learning from others, and putting a Canadian spin on it is the way to go. So you're absolutely right. Yes? It's my, I was going to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I, well, m myself, I have uh, supported proportional representation for many years, and so. Anyway, there is no question in my mind that's the, the just system. But anyway, the, my question is uh, is specifically, well, I'm just wondering, is about like why is it like the Anglo-Saxon countries have some kind of seem to be like retarded in this area? <laughs> <laughs> and like what is how to explain that? Is it something about political the nature of political control, or is it just some kind of special apathy among the Anglo-Saxon countries? So please. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Does anybody have well, any? Australia and New Zealand yes. are Anglo-Saxon, as we are. We're less Anglo-Saxon than either. And they think they've changed. So I don't think it's in the genes. Scotland has changed. Uh, I don't know if it's Anglo, but it's maybe a bit Saxon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think the outliers are, are the United Kingdom and Canadian Conservatives and Liberals. No, and the U.S. Don't forget the United States, which is yeah. the worst. Well, that's not a parliamentary system. And, uh, you know, people like Ralph Nader are... I mean, the worst yeah, in the world the United States. States. You know, the, uh, it's a very different system. You, you can't talk really about two parties in the U.S. because of the electoral college and Congress. So. Which makes no sense. Yeah, very unusual system. More, or have we... Yes. What really needs to happen is to get the youth involved at a very early age. I grew up in Germany, and you know, in primary school, we were already talking about our municipal government. We got to know our mayor's office. We got to, you know, the teacher took us to, you know, to the office to introduce us to the mayor to give us an idea of how our local government works. You know, straight in our little hometown, and then it went on from there. Um, you know, and, and we had, you know, vivid discussions in class with teachers. Uh, and here it seems to me, I, you know, I have two children that grew up in Canada, 
And um, politics, oh no, you don't talk about politics. This is something, it's sort of a taboo subject that you don't really, even civics classes, you know, it's sort of a, yes, a rundown of how the system works. You know, the rudimentary skeleton, here it is. But please, you know, don't, you know, be partisan or start to talk about. Don't get um, me started on those civics exactly. courses. Right, well, you know, you, you have to. Agree Part of the know. problem That's is that the, the way they timetable teachers in high school yeah. uh, is that if there's a slot um, in your timetable because not enough kids have signed up for aircraft or history or anything, um, whoopee, you get to teach civics. And <laughs> this is a real motivator. Um, and uh, one thing I do know, there's an initiative within Fair Vote to develop specific curricula to help out civics teachers because the hurdle is not that the teachers are unmotivated, it's that they're extremely intimidated. A teacher who knows how to teach math or knows how to teach um, cutting hair um, feels very threatened in being required to teach something that they haven't had any training for and there hasn't been any training for civics because everybody is supposed to be able to do it. So these fair vote modules that are being developed um, are going to be greatly appreciated I think by teachers because they're so motivated to do the best for their kids. Yes, um, who? <laughs> I really have a question because it is important, the timing of the essence and uh, what you are saying is uh, there is 2013 which is going to come and how do we organize ourselves or what steps are we going to take to actually move it and put the process in place so that we can achieve it within the next three years or four years. Um, is, is there a thought and, and the set of uh, steps uh, to actually get us there because Right now, it's kind of debate what I yeah. hear. But well, try and join. Go to other meetings like this. See if you're comfortable in a fair vote <laughs> group or uh, the Canadians for um, electoral, uh, this, this group, the Canadian Electoral Alliance. Um, and there are other groups around and see what you think. And if you're uh, talking if you're about myself, but I'm talking about the process that mobilizes the people at large. I am already part of the distribution list on the third vote, so that's mm -hmm, why I'm mm -hmm. here. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, but the point is, what about all of those 750 people that I work with that don't even know that it exists? Well, talk so, to, do what Peter has done. You and will not believe, and I try I one. Talk. I can talk. Yeah, try no one. Yeah. And I don't have the tools. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have the tools, you know, so, so it's very difficult to engage those it's a people challenge. who are not yeah. engaged, and, and how do we do that? All I can say is keep trying, and you'll find one person, and then you'll build from there. I think Marsha. Fair Vote can provide for you. Yeah, I, 10 years ago, we would talk about proportional representation, and people would not know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now if I go around on a button, bags, people say, oh, Fair Vote representation so it can happen and one-on-one -on -one is a great way of getting it so basically what I'm saying is that we all as individuals have to engage and yes. mobilize yes. everybody yes. and that yes. is the process that, that yes. you have to follow maybe feed them dinner that seems to have worked <laughs> yes I thought you didn't change your mind about, uh, okay. uh, structural change but to talk about, for example, Bill C-38. You gotta say, what, why do we need all of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marcia. I wanted to comment about the comment about education. Um, back, way back, a uh, certain government in Ontario took out courses such as media literacy, those critical thinking uh, uh, skills that actually students could opt for, that would have been the Harris government, yep. right, and that's what happened. And uh, just to say that in Toronto, the Toronto Board of Education uh, encourages, I think they still do controversial issues, which would be perfect for this. But other boards, I don't think they do, they shy away from them Absolutely. incredibly. Um, and there's all this controversy now going on about how 
I want my, my child to opt out of certain yep. things. You know what that's about. Well, that's what happened when I introduced it in my kids' school because they, I grew up in a political household. My father was a member of uh, parliament in Germany uh, and a lawyer. So I grew up in that environment of being stimulated you know, all the time, talking about politics at the dinner table and having interesting people coming over at dinner parties and knowing you know, about the European system and then internationally as well. But, you know, here, every time I tried to talk about that in my kids' school, I was discouraged and I was told that it's a taboo subject, that's religion, politics, you know, you don't talk about these things in Canada, you're from some weird place over there in Europe. These Europeans are too liberal, you know, you talk about sex, you talk about, you know, you guys are way too liberal over there in Europe, and, and you know, you can't. No, no, and this is the principles. Uh, in Caledon, which is not, you know, this is a, this is a you know, very conservative area that they both grew up in, in Caledon, and uh, in small town, and oh yeah, no, exactly, and you know, and, and even today I still have a hard time with um, a lot of young people, even students at, 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 um, at this age, in their 20s, to, you know, to really encourage them to uh, start talking about politics, because it creates controversy, and controversy is discouraged. Yes, you don't have debates. Oh, geez, you know, this is, you know, debating something. I mean, wait a second, you know, this is not what one does. I wouldn't want to interrupt any of this because it's been just wonderful and terrific. I thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, I, and I, I love this conversation toward the end about how important it is to continue discussions of these 